Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to what I hope you'll find to be a most interesting session on developments in stem cell science over the last few years and what it means for the future of medicine. Uh, my name is John Thomas. I'm the chairman of the board of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is the California State Stem Cell Research Funding Agency, you may recall, created 10 years ago by Proposition 71 on the California ballot. Uh, we have been uh, funding research now for about 10 years, uh, about 2.2 billion into our 3 billion and have a great body of research that we have funded uh, across the spectrum of medical research, starting with basic biology all the way up through human clinical trials. Uh, we're going to speak to you today, uh, I and four of my colleagues here, who are all folks who are receiving funding from CIRM for one project or another, uh, chosen to give you a, a sampling of types of research that is being done uh, in the stem cell space. Uh, from left to right here, uh, these are all uh, distinguished folk, of course, and they all have incredibly long titles, which I asked them to write down with lots of immunologies and molecular biologies and everything else, but they simply uh, preferred to go by Dr. Allison Watry, a pro assistant professor at UCSD, Dr. Jill Helms, who is a professor in the Department of Surgery at Stanford, Dr. Paula Cannon, who is an assistant professor at USC, and Eugene Brandon, who is the director for strategic relations and project management at a company in San Diego called Viasite. Before we turn it over to them, I thought I'd give you just a quick little history of significant medical developments that will inform this discussion. Uh, the story, uh, and believe me, it sounds like it's going to be long, but it isn't. The story starts several decades ago with the advent of bone marrow transplants as a way for treating uh, lymphoma. Bone marrow transplants involve something called hematopoietic or blood-forming stem cells, which are generated by the bone marrow and create all the different types of blood cells in the body, those being white blood cells which fight disease, red blood cells which carry oxygen, and platelets which uh, facilitate clotting of the blood. Th this was the first type of stem cell treatment uh, really created and of course is now decades into being a long respected means of treating that particular condition. <clears throat> Flash forward now, the story uh, really gets going in the 90s uh, with the uh, story you will all remember, uh, the cloning of Dolly the sheep uh, created great uh, interest as well as ethical uproar throughout the United States and the world. Uh, cloning, for those of, those, uh, those of you not particularly familiar with it, involves taking an adult stem cell, taking the, the DNA, the nucleus out of that cell, having a donor cell from uh, a female taking the DNA out of that donor cell. So now you just have a shell into which you put the DNA from the, the entity you want to clone and you trick it into thinking it's fertilized with an electric shock and lo and behold an embryo develops that ultimately when brought to term is an exact replica of the donor. Uh, Dolly the sheep was uh, from a mammary gland of a donor sheep. Uh, the name Dolly, you can probably figure out where that came from as a result. Uh, and uh, it was a very, uh, very major development, uh, in which we'll circle back to in a second. In 1998, you had the first isolation of human embryonic stem cells by Dr. Jamie Thompson at the University of Wisconsin. That was one of those watershed moments. You heard about it, you said, this is going to be the start of something big because embryonic stem cells are those cells derived from 14-day-old embryos that become everything in your body. And you figured, boy, this is gonna set off a whole series of experiments and research projects that ultimately will lead to the development of all sorts of stuff to put in to cure degenerative disease, and ultimately it was thought to uh, create organs for transplantation and a variety of other things. 
Uh, you sort of move uh, into the early 2000s. You had work being done in that field. You also had work that was being done in adult stem cells, which you've heard about, which are uh, a type of stem cell that basically uh, fights uh, conditions in the particular type of cell that it corresponds to degeneration or injury or whatever and regenerates. And a great example of that would be the, uh, ce the stem cells in your skin, which if you have a wound or injury, help to regenerate skin uh, as you go forward. Lots of work being done. You've heard there are a number of companies that have been formed uh, with respect to adult stem cells. 2004, CIRM comes along. Uh, and, and for those of you who were in California at the time, you can only appreciate that this is the sort of thing that uh, only happens in California. Uh, it was a, a, a really a change in paradigm of the way medical research is funded, the allocation of $3 billion of taxpayer money. Uh, and it has led to, as I say, uh, a, a portfolio that you're going to hear a lot more about today. Uh, just note that we are funding research in 39 currently incurable diseases and conditions and have funded entities up and down California, I think around 65 now, uh, many at medical school uh, research uh, departments, a number in research institutes such as the Gladstone or the Salk or Scripps, uh, and a number of biotech companies such as Viacite. Uh, if you then proceed along in, in this continuum, the next thing that happens was a scientist got a, an idea thinking back to Dolly about taking a cell and turning back the clock, in that case to clone a sheep, he came up with the question, what if you took a skin cell and exposed it to a series of proteins, perhaps you can reverse engineer that cell back into embryonic stage and then trigger a bunch of reprogramming through other proteins to make that cell become a neuron or a blood cell or whatever. Uh, how we thought to really ask that question is a great question. Uh, how we thought he'd ever succeed is an even bigger one, but succeed he did. Uh, and in very short order, uh, developed a procedure where you can take a skin cell from you uh, and reverse engineer it into embryonic form and then create cells in a dish that are your cells. That was called induced pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent means can become anything in the body. And he did that uh, and in record time was awarded the Nobel Prize, you may recall, a couple of years ago. Uh, that's something you're going to hear about from uh, Allison, uh, the embryonic stem cells you're going to hear about from Eugene. Uh, there was a lot of work done in different kinds of stem cells. If you took your own stem cell and tried to produce something from it, that was called an autologous stem cell. Uh, if you take someone else's stem cells and then put it into a third party, that's called allogeneic. A uh, lot of work being done in both areas. Jill's going to be talking about autologous uh, in particular with respect to the project she's working on. Uh, another thing that happened is you may have heard in the 90s there was a lot of momentum in gene therapy. Uh, ran up against some real problems, a, a most unfortunate death of a uh, of somebody who was uh, the subject of gene therapy in the 90s, and that got put on hold for many years, really stalled as a result. Now gene therapy is making a comeback where you actually go in and you can take DNA that is mutated in some fashion or another that causes a particular disease and have that gene either modified or literally excised out with enzymes that can go in and cut specific DNA base pairs. Uh, and you can, through that, actually modify the gene so as the particular cell in question develops, it no longer has that mutation. If you combine that gene therapy technique uh, with stem cells, where you actually are programming stem cells to become something that has the genes modified that helps treat a particular condition, you can have some very interesting things happening. And Paula will be speaking about that uh, with respect to HIV AIDS. So what's happened the last few years? Well, the pace continues to go like crazy. We've had something, uh, some scientists up at Stanford figured out, well, if you can reverse engineer a cell back to embryonic stage, why not skip the whole thing and change a 
blood cell directly into a neuron or a skin cell directly into a neuron. That's called transdifferentiation, and that is now possible. Uh, then you go full circle and you move, in the last few weeks, perhaps you heard that if you go back to Dolly, many things have been cloned since Dolly. Cats, dogs, variety of endangered species, cattle, etc. cetera. Uh, no humans had ever been successfully cloned until last year. Now I wager that unlike when Dolly was cloned and everybody heard about it, if I asked for a show of hands, who knew that humans were cloned a year ago, probably not get many. That research was just duplicated by another set of scientists within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and you say, well, gee, why do we want that? We don't want boys from Brazil and all this sort of thing. Uh, and the answer is that it provides another source of stem cells. So if you clone a person's, uh, uh, clone a person, that will generate an embryo that you can take out uh, the stem cells from and do various experiments that you would typically do on embryonic stem cells and if you come up with something you can then put it back into the person uh, and not have to worry about any sort of rejection that you see sometimes in transplants. Uh, by the way, what Allison is going to talk about, the induced pluripotent also means putting your own cells back into you. So if you have Alzheimer's, for example, can't test a bunch of drugs on somebody who has Alzheimer's, but if you get their skin cell reverse engineered and program it to become a neuron in a dish and you get lots of neurons that start to develop the symptoms of your Alzheimer's in a dish and you screen drugs against that, you can throw hundreds of thousands and millions of different compounds against it to determine if anything uh, reverses the, the course of the disease and that ultimately could well lead to a treatment for something like that. So, as a very whirlwind backdrop to everything you're going to hear, uh, that is what has happened in the last 20 years of medical science as it pertains to the stem cell space. And with that, let's now turn it over to Allison, to, I'm sorry, to Eugene, uh, to talk about uh, embryonic stem cells and the promise that they provide. Thank you, JT, and I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to join this uh, panel today. Indeed, it's a very exciting time now for stem cells and uh, biomedical research as we are now taking these ideas from 10 years ago when, say, when 1998, when human embryonic stem cells were first uh, des described and bringing them into clinical trials so that we can, in the next few years, start to see is this um, potential really going to pan out and become all that we think it might be. So uh, if we can show the first slide, <clears throat> we'll do a little uh, stem cell 101 just to get everyone on the same page here. This is a slide from CIRM, and the question is, what is a stem cell? Well, stem cells are source cells or beginning cells, and although there's different types of stem cells, they all share two remarkable properties. And the first one is that stem cells can make other cell types. That's sort of what a stem cell does. All the different differentiated cell types, all the different tissues in your body came once from a stem cell. So that gives you a lot of power. And that is called the, pot the potency of that type of stem cell. The second property of stem cells, which is um, also very important, uh, but perhaps less appreciated is that these cells can make more of themselves so they can self-renew. And why this is important is if you want to make a product or a new treatment for a disease, you need to be able to make as much of that as you need. So this property, the self-renewing property of stem cells, allows you to create many, many doses of a new treatment for a disease. Okay, next slide. So what this is showing is the embryonic stem cell on the left, which has the, the greatest degree of potency, if you will. It's called pluripotency, John JT mentioned. And uh, as uh, a person develops or becomes an adult, there still are resident stem cells in the tissues in your body, but none have the potency of an embryonic stem cell. So let's go to the next slide. So this slide is to illustrate this point that the embryonic stem cell sits at the top of a decision tree. So this cell can be maintained in this state 
indefinitely in the lab um, to create cell mass or, or an amount of material that you need to work with. But uh, as it occurs in development, uh, next slide, you can, you can see that this cell can be sent down one of these differentiation paths. And what this is, is recapitulating natural development. So repeating how things happen when the cells normally become the different tissues in the body. And so what you need to do in order to harness this potential of embryonic stem cells and turn it into a product, say something to replace the heart muscle or the liver, is figure out the cues. So these are chemicals, proteins, essentially guideposts at each one of these decision points that tells the cell take a left or take a right. So this is the trick. So the first thing you want to do is make a lot of these cells. The second thing is make them into your tissue of choice. But the challenge is figuring out the recipe, if you will, to make them into the tissue of choice. And what's happened over the last 10 years since 1998 is various laboratories and companies have figured out the recipes for these various tissues around this diagram. So you can go to the next slide. This is just showing each time you take a step down one of these pathway steps, you lose the potential to make those other tissues. One more slide. Now we've narrowed it down to just a few organs up and down your gut tube. And then the last slide in this series, uh, one more, sorry, shows you that you can figure out this entire pathway through these specific cell types that gets you to the organ of choice. So pancreas, uh, why would you want to make pancreas? You go to the next slide. <clears throat> people with type 1 diabetes, sorry, people with type 1 diabetes have lost the insulin producing cells in their pancreas. And what we've uh, learned over the last 10 years is that if you replace those insulin cells with an islet transplant, so this is the insulin producing cells from pancreas of a donor organ, so someone who's kind enough to donate their pancreas when they pass away, uh, you can take those islets, implant them into a person with type 1 diabetes, and essentially cure them of their disease. Now, there's two major problems with this approach. While it's highly effective, uh, the source of this material is very limited. As I'm sure you're aware, donor organs are always in, in scant supply. And secondly, uh, these patients have to take immunosuppressant drugs, which are a necessary evil given their situation. But immunosuppressants come with all kinds of unfortunate side effects. So uh, what we uh, would like to do is, rather than use this cadaver material and immunosuppressants, is come up with a new approach, which is to use the embryonic stem cell-based pancreas tissue. And as I've described, you can make that in large quantities, so you're not limited, like with the cadaver islets and uh, use a special protective device to uh, protect the cells from the immune system. So go to the next slide. So the way this works is um, you make the, ce the cells of choice, in this case, pancreatic islet cells. These, these go into a, a packet, a device, which is essentially, you could think of it as a high-tech tea bag. It, allows, it keeps the cells inside and keeps cells outside, but allows uh, important things, oxygen, uh, sugar, blood glucose, uh, or glucose, and proteins and so forth to pass through it. This goes under the skin and uh, matures into uh, cells that can make insulin in response to changes in blood glucose. So this could potentially be a very powerful therapy for uh, people with type 1 diabetes. And uh, clinical trials with this type of approach will be coming in the next years. And the next slide is really just illustrating that this kind of approach, I, I've talked about diabetes, but this kind of approach is being used in many different diseases. Uh, any kind of disease where there's a specific cell type that's lost, if you can figure out the recipe for making that cell type from embryonic stem cells, now you have an opportunity to really make a big difference in that disease. And each one of these um, is now being approached with an embryonic stem cell treatment. They're in various stages of clinical trials and preclinical development. So in the coming years, in the next few years, I think we're going to see a lot of interesting uh, data and results on how these uh, approaches pan out. That's what I have. So next slide. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Jean. Paula. Okay.
Hi, everyone. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about not just um, how we could make stem cells, but actually how we could make them better. And this is using the tools that have been developed in the gene therapy field um, over the past 20 years. And I'm going to tell you a very short story about how we could apply this to develop a therapy for HIV and AIDS. Next slide, please. Um, so first of all, the stem cells that I work with are the hematopoietic or blood-forming stem cells. And everybody has these. They're present in the bone marrow, in the long bones of the body. And they basically, they work very hard to constantly um, replenish our blood and immune cells. Um, and the, uh, one of the progeny that they produce, one of the daughter cells, if you like, is down there at the bottom. It's called the CD4 T cell. And this is one of your white blood cells, and it's a very important one. It's sort of like a master conductor of the orchestra of the immune system. And um, what's very important about this as well is that the HIV virus, of all the cells in the body it could choose to infect, it actually chooses to infect CD4 T cells. And because it kills the, the cells that it infects, that's why HIV infection leads to a sort of a collapse of the immune system and why people develop AIDS. Next slide, please. So um, even in this country, I want to give you a little bit of um, data about um, HIV AIDS because, you know, we have some pretty amazing drugs right now that people can take and it can control their virus and keep it down to almost undetectable levels. There's over one million Americans that are, being, um, that, that are HIV infected, but only, it's estimated that only 25% of that number of people actually manage to get these drugs and take them every day and have a good response with them. So clearly, if we could do something that went beyond having people take you know, drugs for the rest of their life, it would be very useful. And in addition, these drugs aren't perfect. Um, they have side effects. Um, they lead to things such as um, premature aging. They're expensive. The lifetime cost is estimated to be up to half a million dollars. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the biggest drawback they have is that although they can control the virus, they never actually cure anybody. So to me, thinking about curing HIV from people, sure, it's aspirational at this point, but this is, I think, a really important goal. And there are some glimmers of hope. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just want to quickly introduce you to this gentleman. His name's Timothy Ray Brown. He lives in San Francisco, and he's also known as the Berlin patient. And this is because when he was in, living in Berlin, he was HIV positive, and he, he also developed leukemia. Now, one of the treatments for leukemia is to give somebody a bone marrow transplant. And Timothy's doctor had this crazy idea that as well as giving Timothy a bone marrow transplant from somebody who was, we say, a, a tissue match donor, he also found somebody who had this um, interesting little genetic quirk that about 1% of us have. It's called being CCR5 negative. Now, CCR5 negative is important because CCR5 refers to one of the molecules on a surface of a CD4 T cell that HIV needs to latch onto in order to get into that cell and kill it. So people who are CCR5 negative, they're actually completely normal, except HIV can't infect their cells, which is a pretty big plus, actually. Um, so because Timothy had this transplant from somebody who was CCR5 negative, it's as if overnight his immune system went from being something that HIV could infect and kill to something that was now resistant to HIV. And the really kind of exciting uh, bottom line is that this happened um, seven years ago, and he's been HIV free since that point, despite the fact he's not taking any anti-HIV drugs. So it's a pretty cool kind of N of one, but obviously we're not going to go out and give everybody bone marrow transplants just because they have HIV infection. It's far too dangerous and difficult a procedure. But we're going to try and do something else instead. Can I have the next slide, please? And so what we're going to attempt to do is take the hematopoietic stem cells out of a person who has HIV infection and use some of the tools of gene therapy to make those stem cells CCR5 negative and then return them back to the patient. And we can do this in a number of ways. Gene therapy really is a very creative um, field, and there's lots of different ways you can do this. But the approach I'm using is, is a type of molecular scissor. 
It's called zinc finger nucleases. And what they basically do is they get into a cell and in all the DNA and all the different genes you have in the cell, these zinc finger nucleases can find the CCR5 gene and then they basically you know, put a little snip in it and they destroy it. So we can take a patient's own hematopoietic stem cells make them CCR5 negative and put them back into the patient and that patient will now start to make HIV resistant CD4 T cells. Will it work? Well, on the next slide, we haven't yet put it in patients but what we've done something <laughs> not quite as good. Um, but this is what we do in the lab. We have a little animal model that we call a humanized mouse. And what this is, is this is a special type of mouse that we can give a human bone marrow transplant to. So we can take some human hematopoietic stem cells and put them into the mouse. And that mouse will actually grow you a, a human immune system. And what's kind of cool about that is it means we can actually infect that mouse with HIV. And then we can test out different drugs and different therapies in a small mouse model. And so when we do that, Okay, there's actually data, there's data on this slide where it's only one piece of data. This is just looking at the levels of HIV in mice that, and the top in black are mice that got the untreated normal human hematopoietic stem cells. So they get HIV infected and they stay HIV infected. But the little guys on the bottom in red, they were mice that received hematopoietic stem cells that we'd engineered with these molecular scissors and then we put them back in. And although they got infected, Actually, within about three months, they were able to cure themselves and rid themselves of HIV. So we're really hoping that we can take what we see in these mice and translate it now into you know, big mice, people. OK, next slide. Um, we've been very fortunate that CIRM chose to fund this project. And they gave us money to form what's called a disease team. And it really is a disease team because we have kind of three components. There's my group at the University of Southern California. There's another academic group at City of Hope, which is a research hospital, a big cancer hospital, also here in Los Angeles. And then importantly, we also have a biotech partner, Sangamo Biosciences, from up in the Bay Area, who've developed the zinc finger nuclease technology. And together, we're working on translating this therapy into patients. Uh, next slide, please. This is just giving you a kind of a timeline of where we are in terms of progress. We've had the funding for almost exactly four years. I think it runs out on the 30th of April, so time's getting tight. Um, but we're at the stage now where we've started submitting the regulatory paperwork to the Food and Drug Administration and other bodies and doing all these sort of necessary safety studies we need to do before we can take this to the clinic. So we're optimistic that we'll be doing this later in the year. And my final slide is just a list of the people that have been involved in this. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Paula. Jill? I wanted to start off with a, an idea that you've already heard about from JT and Eugene. Next slide, please. And that's the simple fact that every tissue in the adult body contains stem cells. And in some tissues, maybe next slide, please, like the bone marrow, there are lots of stem cells, and in other tissues, like the brain, there are much fewer stem cells. But nonetheless, all adult tissues contain stem cells. Next slide. And the basic idea we have here is that aging changes stem cells, like the epidermal stem cell produces less collagen, and as a consequence, skin loses its elasticity. The melanocyte stops producing pigment, and hair becomes gray. But in the skeleton, when the skeletal stem cell ages, then there are far more important consequences, consequences rather than these cosmetic concerns. Because the skeletal stem cell means, as it ages, it means a soaring risk in the, um, in the number of bone fractures that are suffered. Next slide, please. So one thing about aged stem cells is it means that we have slower healing. And slower healing doesn't just mean uh, maybe a loss of uh, potential or, or inconvenience. It can have a profound sense of, uh, profound impact on a patient's sense of well-being. Next slide, please. These skeletal stem cells maintain our bone mass and slower healing or no healing becomes a big financial burden. And the estimated uh, cost for bone graft substitutes is nearly $2 billion. Next slide. So our strategy is to reverse the effects of stem cell aging and to restore the bone forming potential of adult stem cells. And I'll show you uh, basically how we attempt to do that. Next slide, please. 
Our strategy is based on a potent stem cell factor called WINT3A. It acts on multiple kinds of stem cells, and the procedure that we're employing is to reactivate aged stem cells to stimulate bone healing. Next slide, please. So a variety of stem cells are responsive to WINT, and I show here just three different kinds of skeletal stem cells, but they all are activated in response to a brief exposure as little as one hour to this WINT protein. Next slide, please. Our strategy is to harvest a patient's own bone marrow during a surgical procedure, and in that pro surgical procedure, treat the bone graft material with WINT3A. Now, this is a procedure that's done outside of the body during the patient's surgery. And the reason we do that is to limit exposure of the body to this potent growth factor. Next slide. When this bone graft material is harvested and put on the back table, the effect is that cells start to die. And exposure to WINT3A reduces the number of cells that are dying. This is a standard procedure in most surgical operations to treat bone injuries. And so pre preserving the survival of these bone graft material is vital to its eventual success. In addition to decreasing cell death, next slide please, exposure to the Wnt protein stimulates cell division. And recall this material is sitting on the back table until the surgeon is ready to introduce it into the body. So these two effects culminate in a more robust response of this autologous bone graft material. Next slide. So the idea is once the bone graft material has been exposed to wind, it's then rinsed, and this is to remove the excess protein, and then it's reintroduced into the patient into the defect site. Next slide. So the CT scan shows you that there's significant amount of bone that forms in the injury site, and this is compare, in comparison to the gold standard and autographed alone. And the CT data is supported by the histology here, you see here, where on the right side, bone forms in response to the Wnt treatment of the bone graft as compared to the autograft alone, which differentiates largely into fat and stromal tissue. Next slide. So here we are on the funding stream. This work has all been funded by CIRM. We began with a basic biology award, the early translational award, which funded our formulation of a Wnt protein and paid for the small animal studies. And we have bridge funding and supplemental funding that allowed us to scale up the production of the Wnt protein and to start doing safety and efficacy studies in larger animals like rabbits. And what we're hoping is in the future that we can apply for a preclinical development award, which will bring us to an IND filing with the Food and Drug Administration. Next slide. So our ultimate goal is to exploit this fact that every adult tissue contains stem cells that can be harnessed for purposes of tissue regeneration and healing. I showed you work here that has to do with bone healing by at Stanford and other labs in California. People are working on the use of cardiac stem cells to treat myocardial infarctions, neural stem cells to treat stroke, epidermal stem cells for skin wound healing, and even hair cells to treat balding. All of these together are based on the idea that our aged bodies can be induced to heal faster through activation of endogenous stem cells. Thank you, Jill. Allison? All right. <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. So I'll be talking about something uh, completely different, which is uh, a new way uh, to use stem cells to understand disease, if we can have the next slide. Um, so my lab actually focuses on autism. I use autism as a model, as a neurological disorder. So most of you have heard about autism. There are two things I would like to, to stress here. First of all, those patients, they have uh, social problems, communication with language, and sometimes they are too focused on a stereotype uh, movement or, or interest, a restricted interest. Uh, another thing is that autism is a large spectrum. There are those mildly cases, but there are more severe types of autism. Next slide. Um, and uh, the other uh, reason why this is so important is the prevalence of autism is quite high. Actually, the new numbers uh, from the CDC states that one in every 68 child would be diagnosed with autism. Next, please. <coughs> and um, this is not only a pediatric disorder. Next slide. 
because when these kids, uh, they grow up, they will actually uh, become very dependent on someone, and this is actually the, uh, the cost over a lifetime of someone with autism. And next slide, please. So finally, um, what I think uh, it's most important is the fact that what we know about autism is that there is a strong genetic component, uh, but there is also an environmental factor, and we don't really understand how these two factors interact with each other. Um, next slide. So there is no cure for autism. There is no such a pill or, or, or <coughs> medicine that one can take and be cured for autism. There are uh, therapies that may help you to cope with autism, but there is no cure. So next slide. Um, when I talk to people about the use of stem cells to model neurological disorders or to model a disease, I often um, uh, have a huge problem uh, to overcome, which is to explain to the public what is a model. And if I ask different people what is a model, I usually get like different answers. If I ask my friend what is a model, next slide please, I, I get this kind of uh, answer, which is not wrong by the way. If I ask a kid what is a model, next slide, uh, sometimes uh, they will come with a train as a, as a model, or if I ask an engineer, he may say that this is a, a model of a flying machine. Nonetheless, all of those answers are correct. And um, the best way uh, to converge all these ideas is just to say that models are simplified representations of the reality. And uh, the best models are the ones that we can increase in complexity to get closer to the reality. So what is the reality? Uh, to study autism, the reality is the human brain. But I cannot just open the skull of the autistic patients and try to, to understand what's going inside. Uh, next. There are a couple of models that we can take advantage. One is post-mortem brain tissues, tissues that the families donate uh, to, to the science. There are not many of those. Uh, uh, peripheric, ce peripheric cell types, such as blood or skin, uh, one can understand about the genetics of autism, but those are really uh, hard to follow up experimentally. We cannot do experiments on blood cells. They don't make uh, brain connections. And there are animal models, but autism is all about a human condition. It's how we relate to each other, how we look each other in the eyes. So it's really hard to translate what we know from animal models uh, to a study with humans. Uh, next slide. So what my lab does is to take advantage of uh, this new technique that uh, John just explained to you, which is to, to uh, convert or, or to transform uh, cells from, 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 from the tissue back to this embryonic state and that's what we call induced pluriprotein stem cells. And from these stem cells, we can make lots of them, and we can induce them to specialize or to differentiate in the relevant cell types. Here, uh, brain cells. Next slide. And that's what we did. Um, the idea was to collect uh, cells from uh, autistic patients and cells from non-affected individuals, differentiate or specialize these cells into brain cells, and look for differences. So those differences will tell us what's wrong uh, in their brains. Next slide. Uh, the first um, challenge was to collect a large amount, um, amount of samples from kids with autism in a very short period of time. So I cannot just ask people to come to the lab and start uh, uh, drawing blood from them. It's really hard to do that. Instead, we took advantage of social networks to create what we call the Tooth Fairy Kit Collection. So we connect with, with these families using social networks, and we send out like a small vial smaller than this, and we ask for the milk tooth. They uh, send it in the mail the milk tooth, and we isolate the dental pulp cells. These are the cells that we use to transform into brain cells. So we did that. Next slide. And uh, when we compare uh, these neurons or these brain cells uh, from the autistic group with the control group initially, we don't see that many differences. But if you zoom in, next slide, you see that um, the autistic neurons they have less spines or less connections between them. Spines are those small protrusions in the, uh, in the branches of these uh, neuronal cells that uh, they use to make synapses or brain connections. Um, so that was amazing to see that we could find differences in these autistic brain cells. Next slide. But perhaps, um, and we can visualize that they are functional using several neurological tools that we have in hand. Next slide. But the most exciting part was uh, when we started treating those cells with some experimental drugs. And we did that. And by just adding some of those drugs in the autistic brain cells, they start to behave like 
normal cells, like control cells again, which goes against with this dogma that those brain cells have this autistic permanent stage. Actually, it seems that we can revert or, or rescue some of those neurological defects using that approach. So that's uh, what I'm doing <coughs> next is like. And um, I'll just finish here by, by thanking the lab, uh, patients and families uh, who contribute to that, and to CIRM. I mean, we are at the, at the stage where we are just testing a couple of drugs in the lab, but we want to test like thousands of drugs at the same time. So they are supporting this uh, next step from the lab. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. So I ask a few questions here of the panel, we'll get your thoughts on a number of, of, uh, number of issues. First of all, CIRM funds research in what's called the valley of death, which sounds like a disease term. It's actually a financial term for those finance people in the audience, uh, where nobody really funds basic research that's viewed as speculative until you really get to the end of phase two of human clinical trials, at which point you've established proof of concept, and then the big money sources, whether it's big pharma, Pfizer, Merck, Roche, et cetera, Biopharma, Amgen, uh, or the venture capitalists really get in the game. Uh, my question is uh, to the panel, we're not yet seeing a lot of action by any of these parties. How do you view their participation ultimately as being critical to the development of all these cellular therapy products? Anybody? Eugene? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, their participation is absolutely critical, I think is the short answer to that. Uh, what's it going to take for those uh, companies to get involved in this? I think it's going to be the proof uh, of principle. So an organization like CIRM is tremendously appreciated for helping to bring these ideas and these projects to a point, just to the point where they can show something that's promising to a company is that, and then the, the company will be able to pick it up and go, okay, now let's take this to the next level. But uh, I think it's just gonna be the proof is in the pudding. These companies uh, remain a little bit skeptical for now that, that they're gonna get involved in this. And, and the main problem is it's complicated. It's not just making a chemical, which uh, you know traditionally drug companies are used to doing. So making a cell therapy is a, is a new level. It's gonna take a, a whole new sort of approach from these companies. Maybe an Amgen would be better prepared to do something like that, but um, it's definitely the next level in terms of a, a medical therapy. Can I get something? Sure. I think now that we see over, I don't know how many <coughs> people here attended the, um, the health conference or the panel that was earlier today, but Francis Collins was talking about the diminished funding from the NIH, which usually funds early uh, staged work, such as some of the work we're talking about, well, that's really been reduced dramatically. So without funding through CIRM or people who are willing to take a chance, you know, on a big future, I think that we really do have, uh, it's a, a, going to be a bottleneck. Great ideas, enormous progress, uh, exciting future, but without funds, um, that's going to stop this pipeline. Yes, Paul. Yeah, and I, I would also add, because in, in the case of the, the project I was telling you about for HIV AIDS, I mean, that was funded completely by CIRM. It was a project that um, the, the NIH, the normal source of funding, um, you know, this wasn't available to us. Everybody kind of went, oh, it's kind of a cute idea, but mm, I don't know. Come back to us when it's working. Um, you know, it, it took, well, I don't know if you saw the number up there, but it was, it was $14 million that it's taken to actually get us to translate this, you know, from the scale of a mouse to the scale of a human being and to do the necessary safety steps. So that level of funding is, is not available to us from sort of traditional funding sources like NIH. And the other thing that's pretty um, unique about the way that CIRM um, does this is, is they, you know, they really encourage us to set up these sort of teams. You know, we had a biotech partner that their pockets weren't deep enough to kind of, you know, they, they, they were a small company, their pockets weren't deep enough to fund this themselves. But we were able to form a, an alliance with them and together we've been developing this and I'm sure this is something that, that we're seeing all over the state where, you know, small startup companies with, you know, good technologies and good ideas are able to get together with, you know, some of the powerhouse academic institutions we have in this state and with some funding, you know, we can move forward. Uh, by the way, uh, you folks would have no reason to know this, but uh, NIH actually had a center for regenerative medicine because it thought this was a very promising field to go into uh, and they had a 
very big name in the field who was the head of it, a gentleman named Mahendra Rao. Uh, within the last few weeks, the NIH has discontinued their Center for Regenerative Medicine. Mahendra has moved to the New York Stem Cell Foundation. And now the whole emphasis that's going to be placed going forward at the NIH in regenerative medicine is very much up in the air, which creates a real problem for scientists around the country who depend on NIH for funding in this field and really sort of further drives home the fact that we have a particularly important function to perform here through our agency uh, to fund the sorts of research that you're hearing about today. Uh, okay, on to another question. Uh, just curious, the panel's thoughts. Uh, we talked about Dolly the sheep, huge controversy. Uh, embryonic stem cells, when they first came out, huge controversy. Now there are polls that are being done that show six to seven out of ten people think embryonic stem cell research is a good thing. W what do you think accounts for this, uh, this diminishing of concern by the general population? Education. Absolutely. Awareness. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of people who are naysayers in the years gone by, and I can think of many politicians that come to mind. None of the names will be mentioned, but um, I think that people learn about stem cells, and they read more, and they see more uh, talks, and scientists have to speak out, even if they don't feel immediately comfortable with addressing lay audiences. But through education, I think people understand, and they, and accordingly, they follow and they believe in its potential as well. You know, many of you will remember when IVF first started, huge controversy, terrible thing, bad development. Uh, it's now been years and years where it's long since been accepted as standard medical practice, and obviously uh, yeah. the, the number of couples that, that owe uh, to IVF technology to conceive their children is astronomical. We think that as things play out here over time, stem cells will be similarly received, and that's sort of what you see uh, at the moment uh, developing and, and sort of the point of that question. Now, you hear lots of stories about stem cells, and there are lots of places all over the world that are promoting stem cell treatments, and people who have incurable disease either themselves or their family members or friends or whatever are desperate and they end up going to these centers in lots of different countries. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and how dangerous this is to the field in general in terms of being misleading, false hope, creating issues with the perception of stem cells in general? Anybody want to take that one, Eugene? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is actually um, more of a PR challenge than I think a, a field might typically have because it all goes back to the idea that this, this <coughs> term, stem cells, covers such a broad variety of types of approaches. And you heard several today. And further, there are people, charlatans if you will, who will take advantage of desperate people and create not, will create products that are not necessarily scientifically, um, you know, have not been shown to be uh, proven out scientifically. Um, s people have actually been um, put in jail because of this, but there's still a whole plethora of, of people who are taking advantage of this situation. I think the best thing that someone who has a, a loved one who has a disease, maybe an incurable disease, is to try to educate yourself as much as you can about it. I think if you are looking into it and you want to be optimistic, you really want to keep maintain the hope, but if you're looking at it and you're saying, is this really true? Like, is this really going to cure that disease? If it's not in Time Magazine or not in the New York Times and not in Science and Nature and Cell, you know, Cell, Stem Cell, um, it's probably not really true. So I think it's a matter of educating yourself and keeping a critical eye. Um, if it's not being tested in, in uh, 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 a nation where they have uh, important regulatory um, restrictions, and these are important because they maintain the safety of all of us, then you need to, have, uh, you need to be a little bit skeptical. 
Oh. I, I also want to say that so the flip side of people, you know, desperate people going to these, you know, companies um, that, where you just look at it and you, you want to, oh, it makes me so crazy. But the flip side of that is I think it really speaks to how much we all, many of us believe that this is going to happen and this is going to provide amazing and different ways to treat diseases. And so when I speak to people, I always say, stay with us, stay the course. We've only been doing this for 10 years. You've no idea how much we've done in 10 years, but, but coming up with new types of medicine, it, it, it moves slower than any of us want. But that's because we're doing it safely and we're doing it in a spirit of openness and we're you know, thinking about how to do this with the appropriate regulations. We're not just going off and setting up a company and getting rich overnight, are we, Eugene? No. Mm -hmm. so, um, so please, you know, uh, be advocates for what we're doing. Don't, it's so easy to say, oh, you guys, you've had all this money for 10 years. What have you done? <sighs> you know, and I, I always say, you know what, in 10 years we've been doing really, really good science. We've laid, it, we've laid the groundwork, not just for this state, but for the rest of the world. And maybe what we've not been so great at is PR and marketing. But what do you guys want? Do you want people who are good scientists and doctors, or do you want marketers, you know? Okay. Sorry, I know there's probably people in the audience I'm insulting there. <laughs> No matter what you say, I'm sure that's true. So, uh, so on, on the subject, uh, and by the way, the, the phenomenon we just described, you may have heard the term stem cell tourism. So if you hear that, that's by definition derogatory and a bad thing. So if anybody you know is going out and thinking that that's a good thing, we would refer them to our website or to people who are experts in the field. Otherwise, they'll be spending lots of money for no result. Uh, on the subject of things happening, I would like to ask each of the panelists some time estimates for when you think therapies are actually going to emerge. Eugene, first for self-replacement therapies. Well, um, I don't want to do the cliche, but I think I'm going to do the cliche, which is that it's going to be about five years or so, five to ten years. Um, I can see of those variety that I put up on that last slide, um, some of those are now in phase two clinical trials. These clinical trials, again, it just takes time to make sure that things are working and that they're safe. But there are, there's at least uh, one company working on the, the retinal treatment that um, has, looks, looks fairly promising. Um, I think the, you know, the, uh, there's a neural stem cell trial for, for ALS that's looking promising. Um, I think, yeah, probably by 2020 or so, we, we should be seeing things happening. Okay, and by the way, before I get to Paula, remember that a great example of, of the time it takes, March of Dimes started in 1938, raising money for polio research. 1955, the Salk vaccine was produced. That was at a time where there was much less money for medical research. Today, largely, I think, due to uh, folks like our agency, we've been able to dramatically accelerate the pace. So I think you're going to start to see things quicker than ever. And as we look back on this period in medical history in 10 to 15 years, you will see that we all are living at a time where some really cool transformative stuff is happening. Paula, on the issue of gene therapy combined with cell therapy. Sure. And especially in the um, arena of the hematopoietic stem cells that I work in, because we have so much history of working with those in bone marrow transplants, that's been going on since the 1950s, it's quite easy to kind of step on top of all that, those advances. So stem cell therapy using hematopoietic stem cells combined with gene therapy is already here. It's already been used to treat diseases. And I think it looks like, to my mind, it's going to be the gold standard treatment for things like um, disorders of the immune system and those um, very, very um, devastating disorders of the blood system, such as sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Okay. Thank you. Jill, for using stem, your own stem cells to do a better job. Well, I think it's low-hanging fruit because you don't have to worry about introducing foreign cells into the body. And it's... Uh, Maybe it's a little bit easier because people have developed protein therapeutics. Um, I think for f to get to phase one trials, I think that five to six years is, is a fairly good estimate. Okay. Allison, for finding drugs through disease in a dish modeling. Yeah, I think this is a, perhaps the fastest track because we know what we are doing. We already have experience, pharma have experience, so it's all familiar uh, territory here. Uh, but it really depends on the type of drugs that we find. If we get a drug that's already on the market uh, or repurpose that from Alzheimer's, for instance, uh, to autism, maybe tomorrow, 
but if you get a drug that will require some uh, chemical modification, we have to go through clinical trials and from that uh, move on to the market. That may take five to 10 years. Okay, quick question. Uh, let's suppose we get these therapies. These things aren't cheap. Who's gonna pay for them? And will we ever have therapies that are readily available to everybody and not just boutique therapies that are out of reach for most patients? Anybody wanna take a stab at that one? Um, well, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a soothsayer, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would like to think, and uh, from what I know about cell therapies, that um, these can be affordable, um, you know, relative to some other treatments, uh, proteins that have to be injected uh, every week or every day, uh, a cell therapy that could last you for months or years could could certainly be cost effective and the insurance companies uh, certainly could pay for that. Yeah, I'll just point out, you, you folks have all heard about genomics, the mapping of your, your DNA, uh, and it, when first developed, that was about $100,000 to map your full genome. It's now down to what, 1,500? I think it's, yeah. 15. yeah. So these things, as they get refined, will get more and more uh, readily accessible to the general public, and in fact, what we're hoping to do is uh, what we create, we have a responsibility to make available in a cost-effective manner to the people of California, but in so doing, we'll also make it available to the people of the nation and the world. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left here. Uh, I want to ask who would like to stick their neck out. I described uh, earlier the sort of the whirlwind of developments in the, the scientific research space. Uh, we're now where we've got this whole menu of things we've talked about over the hour. Uh, what's going to be the next big thing? I'll, I'll take a guess. Jill. So is, you were saying no crystal ball, but I believe that the ability to change an old cell into an embryonic-like stem cell in a dish, which has been proven now uh, across the world in laboratories across the world, I think that that can be achieved in vivo, in the body, in a way that decelerates aging. Oh. Yeah, well, he said stick your neck out, right? So that was, yeah, it's right about there. Uh, I, I should note, you, you may have heard uh, Art Levinson, former uh, CEO of Genentech, has started a company funded by Google called Calico. Uh, and Calico's modest goal is to dramatically increase the lifespan of humans, and not by two or three years. They're talking magnitudes. Uh, the company just started at the end of last year. Art's been busily recruiting folks to build up the staff and has been uh, very uh, silent to date about exactly what the strategies are, but the sort of thing Jill just mentioned would fit right into that, and, and it, at some point in the near future, I'm sure we'll start to hear. It's, it's a very uh, exciting Google-type, sky's the limit project. So the last thing I'd like to close with is a point Jill brought up, which is uh, the funding issue. Uh, CIRM has $3 billion to work with. Sounds like a huge amount, and in the field of medical research, it is. Uh, however, uh, medical research is very expensive. We're in transformative, cutting-edge ground. Uh, and in three years, we are going to be through our $3 billion with a bunch of projects that have not yet reached proof of concept. Uh, if we are unable to figure out how to fund it subsequent to that, we will have a tremendous body of work and an infrastructure of scientific research here in the state that basically will hit the wall. So uh, if there are those of you in the audience who would be interested in talking about alternative funding to keep the, the game going here, uh, that's my number one priority going forward here because we have uh, a chance here. Lots of, lots of people say what they do can change the world, and it's true. This can really change the world. Every single thing we come up with revolutionizes treatment for that particular disease or condition. And it's our hope that we'll be able to fund this for many years going forward and keep the ball rolling. So, members of the panel, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, thank you audience. <laughs>